Okay, and I'm gonna just share my screen. Um, so what I'm doing today, guys, is I'm just gonna present the information. Um, and uh, like I said, if you can try to hold, just like note down your um, questions and your thoughts while I'm just like dumping this <laughs> information at you. And, um, and then we can bring it up at the end just so that there's not as much back and forth. Um, if you can um, mute yourselves, that would be perfect, just so that we don't have any background noise. So, okay, wrote, I'm gonna try and do this in 20 minutes, here we go. Um, so the, the first part about what we're gonna do today. So the first thing is we're gonna go over why we even wanted to do this. I think a lot of you are Okay, whoever is talking right now, can you please mute yourself? <laughs> um, we're gonna talk about our group format. We're gonna talk about how to prepare uh, ourselves and clients for group, the group structure. And then, like I said, um, in the last half hour to 20 minutes, we're gonna create a little bit of space for um, comments. And then after today, I am gonna send you a huge long Google doc that's gonna be public. Um, I didn't want to do a PDF because I want everyone to be able to just take the information and copy and paste it to whatever you need. So I'll share that Google mm -hmm. Doc that's going to have all of this information in it today. So you don't have to write any of this down. It's going to be all sent to you once I get it done. <laughs> um, okay. I'm going to actually... So I have to try and present this while seeing some of your faces and seeing the material. So this is, this is fun. Okay. So the reason why we wanted to do this, so at peak, we're a private practice and we, um, we have a bunch of counselors who are essentially contractors. So we get, um, uh, Heather, I'm just going to ask if you can monitor the chat room while I'm presenting, that would be amazing so that I don't have to keep poking in there. Um, we wanted to give back to the community. We recognize like what uh, situation we're in and we just wanted to be able to give back because so many people won't be able to access services because of loss of jobs and loss of benefits and all of those things. We also really wanted to engage people right now because all of the studies that we've seen um, and the information that's coming from other countries is that as a pandemic response continues and as a quarantine um, and sort of keeping people in continues, mental health has been shown in other places to deteriorate further as it goes on. So I think starting sooner and starting now can engage people to create some sort of a semblance of um, a relationship to a mental health practitioner, get some group support, and then if they sort of get worse on their mental health front, they've already kind of connected with you and, and you might be able to help them get um, a higher level of support. Um, we also just want to connect people because we're all sitting randomly in our houses, most of us. Um, and we really, same with what we're trying to do here, we're just trying to get crowdsource information and like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And, and um, that was uh, some of the themes from our first few groups was number one, gratitude for seeing humans and talking to other people in an emotionally relatively safe place. A lot of gratitude for that. And number two, people were really sharing ideas in between themselves. And it was so cool to see um, that being done in a, in a relatively safe enough way facilitated by mental health professionals. The other, oh, sorry, just bear with me here. Um, okay. The other um, reasons we wanted to uh, do all of this is to just share, um, start a conversation with mental health providers, scale up free or low cost services on an insanely large level um, so that because we've had 
unbelievable interest in our free support groups from our community. We started advertising them. We had one full in a day, which we had 10 people in each group. And now we are filling up our fifth group. So that's almost 50 people um, with 10 people in each group. So we just recognize like there's no way we can do all the groups all the time. And like I said, I think now is the time to start really implementing some of these um, new services just because I do not think mental health is gonna get better with more confinement. <laughs> so, um, okay. So the first thing we did when tr just like brainstorming and, and we brainstormed as a team and I'm very grateful to all of our team for their thoughts and contributions we started to think about sustainability and as a private practice we pay our bills with client fees and and a lot of our clients have benefits but a lot of our clients pay out of pocket um and and they share that they're happy to do that and that it's worth it for them but we wanted to to increase the visibility and connectivity of mental health supports so we wanted to connect people and we wanted to support a lot of people. So we thought, hey, we can support a lot more people in a group setting and we can um, connect people. So two birds, one stone. And um, I'll just tell you exactly how we figured it out in terms of uh, workload and, and finances. I have been contributing as a practice owner to pay a fee to the counselors who are running it, even though I'm not getting revenue from the groups myself, this is my way of donating and that felt okay for me. Um, and then the counselors who are running it are sort of donating in a sense because they aren't getting the, the normal fee that they would normally get for running a group. They're, they're taking a dramatically sort of reduced rate, but they're still getting paid something to run it. So we felt for us that that was a balance that's going to be different in agencies and nonprofits and stuff. So, so that'll be different for everyone. Also, we really used, like we tried to stay in our lane, like what groups have we tried to run before? What do we already feel relatively comfortable doing and what will be so general that we can go with the flow because everything is changing all the time right now. And then we try and built in a support system for um, to further make it sustainable so that the people running the groups um, are running in pairs if possible. And then if they are running it on their own, they're debriefing with someone after the fact. So that's what we started with. And then we landed on um, a semi open group format. So for us, what that means, just making stuff up. Um, for us, what that means is the registrations we get for our group programs, we put them into a group and that is essentially the group that we are recommending that they stay in. And we also recommend if they can to try and attend at least four sessions to see if it's a good fit for them um, just to promote as much cohesion and group safety as possible. Um, but that being said, we know that it's a crisis right now, so people can't um, commit to anything. So we encourage attendance, but we are keeping it open. We also have said, you know, we're going to try to continue to run this group as long as it's needed. And so we've tentatively said, you know, we'll start with 10 sessions, but we'll try to continue it moving forward. But I'm also um, looking into how can I afford to continue? So maybe we're looking into like donation options and, and other forms of being able to make this sustainable. The, the model that we were using is just a little bit of process. So how are you feeling? How are you feeling? What comes up for you? Um, and a little bit of psychoeducation and resource building, all under the umbrella of, for us, um, having a trauma-informed lens, which just means creating as much safety as possible, and um, 
having a intersectional feminist lens. So, so really recognizing that everyone in our world and in our society is at different positions of intersections of how much they are dealing with oppression and um, forces that are impacting their mental health. So we keep that um, really front and center when we're working with people. We just thought, why don't we just have a simple check-in, resource building based on the themes that come up in check-in, and a checkout. And so um, I'm just going to double check. Okay. Sorry, guys. Any, I'm just going to pause right now. Any questions so far, knowing that I'm going to continue to just rattle off this information and we can take questions um, at the end. But if there's any urgent ones right now, let me know. Okay. So in terms of the length of group, we thought the shortest it could be was about an hour. Um, that might be different for different populations. Um, we thought the m most people we could fit into a group while also um, encouraging human connection was 10. Um, and we might continue to reevaluate that moving forward based on how it's going. And we're being super transparent and and you using immediacy and just saying, hey, this is this is what we're doing. How's it working? What can we change? What can we do differently? Um, and like I said, trying to have two facilitators per group because there's also like tech issues. Like as you know, I've asked Heather to kind of help me out a few times here. So it's really helpful to have sort of a, a lead and maybe more of a backup and someone to, to sort of chat privately with someone if they're having a safety concern or if they are potentially um, breaching any of the group guidelines. So the things we do before groups. So like I said, the software that we're using to manage our entire process, our charting, our intakes, our bookings, everything is the Jane app. So if you Google Jane app, you'll see what that's all about if you're not familiar with it. And on the Jane app, we have an intake form, we have our, our consent, and um, we, we collect all of the information through Jane virtually without really any contact with the client itself. Then the group facilitators review the information and see if there's any safety concerns. And based the first group we ran, we did intakes with every single person. We didn't know what we were expecting. Now we've tried to kind of pull back a little bit. And with some of our groups based on comfort levels, we're only going to screen um, and call or video session people who, who indicate safety concerns in their intake information. So whether that's suicidal ideation, um, safety concerns in the home, stuff like that. So um, you can figure out what feels comfortable for you with your community, the amount of risk that you're dealing with, all of that. This is the bare minimum of what we've tried to do and we continue to tweak it as we learn more. So when we do the um, group screening, so we'll do it either over phone or Zoom is ideal because then you can see if it works for the person and the person can test it out and you can practice the reactions and stuff like that. Um, so it's about 10 or 20 minutes. We're just trying to limit it to, to just reduce the workload of screening people. Um, we just briefly talk about the group format. We talk about how many people are going to be in there. We talk to people about confidentiality and everything that we did here, which is how to take yourself off camera, how to change your name. Um, just share what you feel comfortable with. You can always feel free to pass. There's never any pressure, um, that sort of thing. And um, we're gonna also talk about group guidelines and talking about what makes us a safe enough group space and how we can work together to create a safe enough space. Um, and we'll just ask some questions around, have they ever done a group before? Have they ever done counseling before? just to get a sense of like where they're at and 
maybe how much education we need to be doing with them um, prior to group. And then if there are some safety concerns, now would be the time to send them um, some resources, um, maybe even a safety plan template or, um, you know, we've got a bunch of resources on mental health supports during COVID and there's a lot of stuff out there and, um, and answering any questions or concerns. So that's a very brief snapshot of what the 10 to 20 minute group preparation sort of screening or intake call or video session looks like. So we get the facilitators, again, to do those calls. And you can make a decision of if you want to do calls with everyone, that's awesome. If you want to limit the workload, maybe in your intake form, you have a little checkbox to, sit to see if they have had group experience and if they have any safety concerns. And then if you, if you have group experience and you don't have any safety concerns, maybe you can um, skip uh, a phone intake or a video intake and maybe do something over email. But we are finding preparation and, and front loading people is, um, is really important, especially because we are in a crisis. We are doing this on the fly. We are adapting as we go. So this is just a little bit of a, a slowing down mechanism and a, a little bit of a safety um, piece that helps us feel somewhat safe <laughs> in doing this, even though it's very nerve wracking to just start these groups up and run with it during a crisis. So like I said, um, we're just going with the flow. So like facilitators, and I, I'm going to call on um, people who have facilitated our group so far. Facilitators have been amazing at just going with the flow and opening up a check-in. So telling people, okay, how are you feeling right now? Maybe in one or two words, limit your check-ins to a, two minutes or less if possible. And um, so they, they ask the people to check in with a few words on how you're feeling right now. Maybe um, something that you are hoping to get out of the group. And then after everyone checks in, um, you can identify themes. Okay, so it sounds like loneliness is a big theme today. Okay, let's talk about, you know, looking in our toolkit and, and figuring out some resources on how to navigate loneliness. And so based on the themes that organically come up in check-in, our facilitators are making um, a real game time decision on bringing in a coping strategy um, I guess a workaround of that, if you wanted to feel a little bit more prepared, is that you have um, a resource like square breathing technique. Can you take people through the square breathing technique um, as an example? Okay, breathe in for four, hold it for four, breathe out for four, hold it for four. You can have some of those resources or activities queued up for yourselves um, while also acknowledging what the um, themes are. You can, you can do both essentially. And then after the resource building, we get a sense from people, okay, let's share one or two words on how you're feeling now and maybe one idea or a goal based on our conversation today that you wanna bring into this next week. So whether that's self-compassion or looking at social connection differently or whatever whatever they take from the group that's their opportunity to share their intention for the week and everyone hearing the intention it's just really um motivating and and uh really reinforcing to hear 10 people talk about what their intention is for the week and to have that check-in coming again the week after so um the theme is roller coaster and otherwise known as this feels weird um i took a a new um I, I took a neuro psych class at some point and they said whenever someone uses the word weird to describe their experience a new neural pathway is being developed so we got a lot of new pathways being developed right now and um for me if i don't like my feelings i just wait five minutes and then i'll have a totally new set of feelings. So that's what we're finding from our, um, our participants as well. 
but I just wanted to, um, if I can, if I can stop and, and transition and, and call on Heather and or Anna um, from Peak Resilience, if you can speak to um, just your general thoughts on what it was like to just jump in with this and how the groups worked. Yeah, I'm happy to start and then Anna can jump in after me. Uh, it was pretty terrifying. <laughs> I'm definitely someone that likes to plan things and likes to have like plan A, plan B, plan C. So I did do a little bit of that, um, which was helpful for me, like having some sense or some assumption that people were going to talk about weirdness and newness and anxiety and all of that stuff just kind of in my back pocket was helpful. But for the most part, it was pretty terrifying at first. And we've had the most gracious understanding clients show up to group that have been very understanding that we're all doing this on the fly. They've really recognized that they're doing a whole lot of stuff on the fly too. And they've been um, really understanding with us being transparent about us being on the fly too. So it's actually worked out really well. I felt a whole lot of relief after the first couple of groups. And at this point I'm, I'm excited to show up and, and keep going to them. Awesome. Anna, are you there? Do you have any other thoughts? I am here, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll echo Heather. Certainly, we did things quite quickly. So um, looking back, I think mapping a workflow, which our admin is, is doing well now. Um, I mean, we didn't need to prioritize that back then. And so we didn't have that until more recently. But um, for bigger groups, organizations, I could see mapping would be helpful because then you're certain of where you're at and all those touch points with the clients that you're intaking or um, sharing information with. Um, but by and large, you know, the on the fly quality of these groups is a huge strength, I think, for this moment we're in because we have a lot in common with one another. The facilitators and the clients are all in that same spot. And so I felt that going into it. You know, I think Heather and I and the clients are all a little bit nervous about we're about to start together here. And so I found that um, powerful and kind of comforting at the same time. That's awesome. Thank you. I, I noticed a, a question in the chat um, about if these groups are ongoing, if they're um, open or closed. So I said at the beginning, um, semi open. <laughs> so we try and um, keep the majority of the people who started a group together, but we recognize that things need to be very um, flexible right now. So some people will not be able to commit to a closed group for a certain amount of weeks. We're making it as accessible as possible. And we're also recognizing that um, having an open group allows us um, just a little bit more flexibility and um, can allow us to adapt a little bit easier. Um, okay, let's see. So um, Heather and Anna, speak to this if I'm missing anything, please. But um, after the group is done, for the most part, from what I'm hearing, the facilitators are sort of jotting down the resources that all the group participants are brainstorming and um, the resources that we've provided as mental health professionals. And at the end, email participants um, with just like a recap, here's the resources, here's this podcast, here's that podcast or whatever. Um, is that correct, Anna and Heather, for the most part? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this is a, a great opportunity. We actually did have a bit of a safety concern in one of our groups. Um, it was a domestic violence situation. And so um, like we heard yelling during the, the session. And so uh, afterwards we followed up with that person um, just to ensure that everything was okay. And um, it, it worked out quite well because that person was already getting support with us anyways. So we were able to sort of really um, support them quite well. And um, again, like we're being just super transparent and open and just saying, hey, like we're kind of running these based on what you want. And so if you, if you don't want them, we won't run them anymore. If we don't need them, we won't run them anymore. And we're, we're going with the flow right now. Um, and a after, um, if you haven't already scheduled um, 
an email to remind participants of the next group, that this would be a great time after your first group to just schedule that email reminder, like, hey, maybe the day before the next group, an email goes out to your participants and says, hey, here's the link, can't wait to see you tomorrow, that sort of thing. Heather and Anna, am I missing anything in terms of what we do in follow-up? Okay. Um, so one little hot tip, figure out what you're gonna wear if you're co-facilitating because <laughs> Um, Kristen and Raylene of our, our team wore the exact same thing on the first day of group and everyone thought it was pretty hilarious. And um, apparently the group at, at checkout asked, asked them what they were planning on wearing for the next group. So um, that was just a little fun thing. Okay, that's a lot of information. Um, let's come back to you guys, okay? And just come back to questions, comments. Um, I'm recognizing that we are presenting this information in incomplete form. And so I'm very okay with feedback and anything that you see that we can be doing better. I have questions. a question, Jennifer. Yes. Um, I'm just curious if you had any issues getting people actually connected to a Zoom platform, and if so, like how did you guide them through that kind of piece? I'm going to let Heather and Anna speak to that. Heather, do you want to go first? Yeah, so in the first stream we didn't run into it. That's okay. Um, yeah, so first stream we actually didn't have any issues with that, but I'm, we're on our fifth stream now and just in kind of coordinating pre-group consults, we've had, or I've had one. Sorry, I've muted a few people. So if you were wanting to talk, you might have to unmute yourself. But, um, okay, so Heather, sorry, go ahead. We, yes, yeah, so there's been one person who's had some issues with Zoom, but mostly just from like having reluctance to using um, data. So they're trying to sort out their Wi-Fi situation on their end and they're trying to sort out, um, they've been in direct contact with, um, with Zoom about how they can kind of get the program on their, uh, on their um, cell phone because they don't have a laptop. But um, based on, on that, we've been like super transparent about we're not Zoom experts. So we've been kind of like encouraging people to talk to Zoom directly about stuff like that. But for the most part, it's been pretty good. And just to speak to the questions on the chat, if Anna, if you're gonna jump in, I'll just jump in here. Um, people are asking what kind of Zoom we're using. And we we already had the, the professional sort of telehealth extra encryption, extra confidentiality version of Zoom before this. So we were, we were kind of set up a little bit more. Um, so it does have servers in Canada and it is, um, according to the BCACC anyways, uh, on the list of sort of approved providers. Yeah. Anna, did you have any thoughts on the Zoom piece? Uh, just briefly, the, the issue with one participant, I think it really had to do with their personal tech or wireless connection. So um, I think what we've seen so far is that the issues are quite individual and specific. So um, we can help troubleshoot some of that, but some of it would have to go back to those basics and looking at what can be done there. And in terms of the recent Zoom privacy breaches, that, that was a question that was asked in chat. Um, honestly, I haven't done anything about it. <laughs> because we use Zoom, we've looked into other platforms, but as a practice, um, we have signed a business associate agreement with Zoom for um, compliancy with confidentiality. Um, as far as we know, we haven't gotten any information from Zoom directly that our privacy has been breached as far as we know. Um, yeah, our, our, our privacy is fine and, and we use all of their little, um, yeah, all their little tips and tricks like waiting rooms um, to make sure everything is as confidential as possible. Yeah, any other? questions 
So as you can tell, this is like just a very simple, simplistic check-in, resource building, check-out. I have another question. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I'm just curious, like in terms of getting your clients, um, like when you're screening them or whatever, and, and you're, what kind of information are you giving them in terms of privacy? Like, yeah, does that make sense? Good question. Heather and Anna, do you want to speak to this? I can start us off. Um, we do front load a lot of privacy confidentiality information in the screening. So for stream one, one of the two streams that I'm holding to co-facilitate, we did do um, individual screening for every person. And um, I wasn't sure how familiar everyone would be with these different platforms. I wasn't sure what tech they'd be having. So we gave a few different ways that people could not have their video up if, for their own privacy and confidentiality, um, put up a photo or something instead, for example, change their alias. And then we did um, what to my mind are the very traditional classic privacy and confidentiality conversations in those screens that we then had in the first session um, and with any new people I imagine we would do that too but we then had that again in the first session just to really reinforce and confirm that you know you take what you learn of, of your own experience you leave the rest um, and so I guess I was having a hey there how you doing points. yeah for us so far Jennifer, I'm also here. I'm one of the facilitators for the Peak Resilience Groups. It's Kristen. Hi, Kristen. <laughs> Hi, nice to see everyone. Um, I just wanted to quickly interject um, around privacy. And one thing, um, just transitioning to a virtual group versus in-person group. So if you have an in-person group, naturally what happens is people will kind of have break off conversations or they'll go for coffee after or they'll coordinate you know um, ride chairs and things like that the virtual world is very different and so um, Heather Anna all of us addressed that at the beginning just letting people know you know naturally people are going to connect and they're going to want to um, potentially connect offline and really ensuring that we're facilitating that um, with people's privacy so ensuring that people aren't you know, disclosing their personal like phone numbers over the group sessions and things like that. And, and we've been kind of the glue. So if say a participant A is interested in, you know, I'm really connected with participant B, you know, do you think I could have their information? Of course, we would not share that information. All we would do is reach out to the participant and say, you know, this person's interested in connecting with you. What are your thoughts about that? Do you want us to help facilitate that? Or is that something that you're not interested in? Um, to kind of be this middle ground to ensure that privacy is protected, but also celebrating the connection that happens in groups as well. Yeah, we've really uh, tried to <laughs> straddle the line essentially between risk taking and scaling this up as fast as we possibly can and creating things consciously and mindfully and ethically. And um, this is absolutely faster than we like to work, probably a hundred times faster than we like to work. But we're also recognizing that, you know, this COVID situation has never happened before. And all of the guidelines and all of the ethics and everything that has been created um, was not created with a, a global catastrophe being present. And so we just have to keep all of our ethics in mind and question everything. But we're finding, I think I'm finding, um, I'd love Heather, Kristen, anyone's thoughts on this, Anna. Um, we are pushing ourselves to be a little out of our comfort zone, that's for sure. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? I'm gonna look at chat. Yeah, there's a couple in the chat. Okay, awesome, thank you. Yeah, for anyone who has to leave the group um, at the, or leave this session right now, I'm gonna send out that Google document with all of this content and all of our informed consent and group guidelines and all of that. And you guys can, um, and intake form stuff, and you guys can just use whatever you need. Um, how many of your group members are current clients? 
good question. So facilitators, thoughts? Yeah, um, so the first stream that I would say was about 50-50. Um, and then in this fifth stream that I've been kind of lining up pre-consultations for, I think eight, seven, seven or eight out of 10 are brand new clients. So people that we've never met before, have never had any contact with Peak before, that have just kind of stumbled upon us through the news or whatever it might be. And yeah, uptick, big uptick for sure. Absolutely. Any other questions or thoughts about how you can adapt this information to your communities and your client populations? Any thoughts? Uh, the person that shared about bereavement uh, wrote a chat note, so we could start there. Amazing. Yay. Um, okay, maybe I'll just defer to you guys, um, Heather and Kristen and Anna, and who else is here? on the team, Aaron, and a couple of other people on the team. So um, can you guys speak to the grief piece? I don't think we're actively supporting anyone who has experienced like direct COVID, um, someone passing away, but yeah, I'll leave it to you guys to chat. Maybe Heather, do you wanna to speak to it first and then I'll Sure. Yeah, I'm just kind of echoing that as far as everybody has shared. We don't have any direct grief. I, th I think that that's a, an amazing idea and they're probably a really great market for that. Um, but grief itself has come up so frequently in the last couple of groups, like people grieving plans, people grieving social connection, physical touch, people grieving um, vacations and celebrations and weddings and all of this stuff has definitely come up quite a bit, I would say. I think um, a benefit of the screening process, although you know it's quite time consuming, um, is nice to hear what people are seeking in the group. And what I'm finding talking to participants, potential participants, is there is a lot, there is an increase now of support for COVID-19, but there's also a decrease in supports for other mental health pieces. And so what's nice about the screening process is really um, discussing what people want to get out of the group, what they may not be able to access through this group, and then what other services we can also connect them with. So a lot of folks are kind of transitioning this new time and, and of course, like co-occurring disorders or um, other things outside of COVID-19 um, do come up and making sure that this, the group is um, like a safe space for individuals because it, it can't be everything for everyone, essentially. Thanks, Kristen. Anna, do you have any thoughts on um, the grief piece or? No? Just, uh, just agree with uh, what Heather spoke to. Okay. I also want to jump in and, and note that um, anticipatory grief is a big thing that we're looking to, to speak with, uh, speak about in our groups, um, because it really is so weird to not know what is going to happen and to not know. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm grieving something I don't even know I'm grieving yet. Um, so yeah, good questions in the chat. Um, Heather or maybe Kristen or Anna, um, what are your thoughts on this question? Curious if you've had to deal with varying opinions or views on what is right or wrong behavior as we see in online forums and support groups. Looks like Kristen has something to say about this one. <laughs> I, was, I was gonna pull from Heather. I, um, I remember our, our first debrief of the group and how um, the space can also, um, sometimes advice giving can happen in the group and advice giving can be um, helpful in some ways but harmful in other ways um, because of course we have our, all of our, our own ways of coping and existing and so um, kind of the curation of group is really ensuring, you know, people are validated for where they're at and what's working for them, but also ensuring that, you know, what, what is working for me is what's working for me. And I joke with my group and I say, you know, listening to rap music and eating Doritos is kind of what's working for me. And I don't, you know, prescribe that to anyone else. 
Um, and so, yeah, like kind of celebrating kind of the personal victories of how we're um, caring for ourselves, but not um, trying to say that that's kind of the, 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 the expectation for everybody. I'm just looking at this question as well, um, considering how this could be adapted to peer to peer group. Um, that's absolutely what I thought. Um, I think that's an amazing idea. And um, I essentially think someone should create that. <laughs> because I was just like, hey, let's stay in our lane and just talk to other mental health professionals. We know that, you know, we're dealing with people who have training and a code of ethics and um, and stuff like that. So that's who, you know, we marketed to. Um, but absolutely, you could take this and adapt it for peer support if, if possible. Yeah. And, um, thanks. And, uh, maybe Anna, can you speak to, um, the time of day that we're offering the groups and, and, um, yeah, how we figured that out? Sure. Um, so the majority of the groups are around five or six in the evening. We do have a 12 o'clock, maybe one or two of those streams going now. Um, and we did rolling screens while polling a bigger community in order to figure out what the best times for people were. So, um, you know, all us facilitators would be scheduling those consults, doing those intakes, asking some information about scheduling from each potential participant there. And then also um, on the social media end, um, Lisa Bay and Jennifer were looking at, you know, how to ask that question in a bigger way. So um, that that's how we've landed on our times. Yeah, we literally had like an Instagram poll, I think. <laughs> and it said, okay, this percentage of people wants it this time and this percentage wants it that time. Um, the other piece, um, we are next week and the week after, we're starting two groups specifically for frontline health professionals. So we have one group that's going to be at 8 a.m. on Wednesdays, and that is specifically tailored towards nurses at after shift change. So that is for our in-person healthcare professionals. That's to support them. We're also going to have a different healthcare professional for telehealth practitioners because that's such a it's such a weird struggle for each different type of work. Um, so we're going to have a telehealth professional group, and we don't know yet exactly. Kristen, do we know when that's going to be yet? Sorry. <laughs> for the telehealth group, yeah. um, no, I don't. I don't have the details for that, but yeah. Uh, yeah, but I'm sure we'll when we follow up with everyone on this, we'll be able to provide that. Yeah, so it's really about trying to, trying to engage your community um, to figure out what they want. It's like a conversation. And that's how we view therapy in general, obviously, especially as um, feminist therapists. Um, we really try and join the client and recognize that we are humans in this exact same situation. Um, we try and have a sense of humor. We try and have humility. We try and um, talk about our own struggles, to, you know, when it's appropriate and helpful. Um, so I think these groups are probably, they're, they're helpful for us too, right? For the facilitators who have, who have um, been facilitating them. How have these groups impacted you emotionally? Anyone want to contribute? Not all at once. I, I'm happy to share. Um, I have felt pretty paralyzed by um, how COVID's impacted me personally, just uh, really uh, missing connection. And I, I love the practice of counseling. And this was a way to really meet that. Um, and and the, flex, the, the flexibility in the group. So we do have some people who are current clients, but then we also have some people who are not clients who would not have access to the service. So it, um, yeah, I think it really, it, for the, like the social justice piece in me and the advocacy piece, um, it definitely is there. But even from the human perspective of just, um, it feels really, really good to have a connection. Like even seeing all of you, you know, I can't believe we have this many participants today. Um, it just lights me up. It makes you realize you're not doing this alone. Awesome. Heather, Anna? 
Yeah, I would echo that big time. And, and for me, as someone who's kind of living alone in, a, in an apartment and feeling definitely lonely and isolated a lot of times throughout this whole pandemic, it has been incredible to just kind of come together and see nine different people from different walks of lives that would probably never meet in any other different circumstances. And like for me, it's been really heartwarming and I've been just filled with gratitude for how like respectful and understanding and compassionate everybody's been towards each other. And yeah, as facilitators, we have, um, we've shared in like an appropriate clinical therapeutic way. And even being there as facilitators, it, it's, it's magical. And I love being a therapist and I love doing group therapy, but also just being there as a human has been really great. I can't recommend it enough. <laughs> Awesome. Anna, do you have anything to add to those lovely words? I do. Yeah, just briefly, I think um, there are a lot of losses going on for all of us. Myself, is, I'm no exception to that. And so group is like a gain. Group is like um, something really meaningful and life-giving. And so um, I, I imagine that as we're all ongoingly impacted by COVID as mental health professionals, you know, seeing ourselves bolstered in these ways and feeling creative and feeling like we are yeah, maybe losing income right now due to this obvious crisis, but increasing our passion, increasing our creativity. I can see this um, being wonderful for me and really enthusiastically promoting it for anyone else who'd like to start these groups too. It's been awesome. Thanks, Anna. Okay, so, so next steps. Um, I'm going to stay on, um, and if any of the group facilitators, Heather, Anna, Kristen, can stay on for a bit, for anyone who wants to ask a few more questions, but I'm, we're basically done for time, so if anyone wants to stay late, we're here. Otherwise, you can sign off. I will be emailing you a link to all of this information um, today when I have proofread it. So, um, so thanks, guys, and... Uh, I think next steps, we're going to try and organize with the BCACC and other colleges. Um, some sort of a listing for support groups would be really nice. Um, so we're trying to get stuff going on that, that end. So awesome. thanks, guys. And the one, one uh, bonus, I'm in sweatpants and socks. So you got to, you got to, be grateful for the wins, you know? Okay, thanks guys. So sign off if you don't have any other um, questions. I'm gonna be emailing everyone here the, the big long resource that you can use. Um, yeah. I'm gonna stop my share for a second. That's better, I can see people. Okay. Great. If it's okay, I would love to um, just uh, clarify kind of the question I had earlier about um, the kind of right and wrong behavior. I'm just wondering, I have an idea of maybe how I would approach this, but I'm wondering if you've had just people kind of um, talking about what's right and wrong in terms of going outside and social distancing and, and how that's been managed. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> I see that a lot in <laughs> different like policing and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to wait for Heather to speak on this. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, that actually hasn't come up in our stream yet, but I imagine that it definitely will and has the potential to come up um, in the future. And we kind of have talked about like, well, what, what do we do if this does come up? And it's been very much what Kristen was talking about earlier around like trying to expect our, or, sorry, respect our experiences. So talking about like, I feel in my experience, this has been scary for me as opposed to like everybody going outside right now is insane or whatever that generalization might look like. Um, luckily we haven't had to do it yet. And also staying away from advice giving and talking more about the feelings that are coming up for people as opposed to um, judging behaviors and things like that. But I will definitely keep that in mind and maybe something we'll add to our growing document if it comes up, but we've been lucky so far. 
that's really nice to hear <laughs> that that hasn't come up. So um, yeah, thank you for thanks for speaking to that. I also think like depending on the type of approach you want to do, you can make it less likely that will happen by picking themes. So if it's a theme that um, is like adjacent to that, but not directly about that, um, for example, um, concerns about health, you know, might be adjacent to that. So that might be helpful too, depending on who you're working with. Um, hi, I, I have a question. <laughs> Um, wondering about frequency of groups. Uh, the reason is because, you know, particularly in a university population, for example, you're dealing with a lot of people who are living by themselves and alone and are, are fairly isolated, despite being able to video conference friends occasionally. Um, I know traditionally you do like once a week kind of groups. I'm wondering about your thoughts on more frequency. I think, yeah, pull the participants and see what, what works well for them and then what is semi-sustainable for you because um, I think one thing that's helping me is recognizing that um, like thinking about okay I might be working virtually and from home until June-ish probably I don't know I mean no one knows right and so we're trying to think of okay this is more long term so if you were running a group three times a week, could you see yourself, or twice a week, could you see yourself doing that for um, maybe like three or four months? Um, and if that is possible, because maybe this, the individual sessions are down, then great. Yeah, I, I say do it as much as um, give the people what they want. <laughs> um, Jackie, something, because that, that's come up in our group, in terms of people wanting more. And um, I know we're, we're limited because we're balancing that like part volunteer, part, part paid. Um, there's a lot of time investment and I know we all have a lot going on on top of just our professional lives. Um, something that's been helpful is learning like what's beneficial, like what are people getting out of the group and how we can almost have like a group goal of creating that outside of the group. So like people sharing kind of these new creative ways of connection or different online groups or support groups and kind of building that, um, that kind of that collective experience of everyone wanting more, but maybe we can't be the only service. Um, there's also the possibility of groups once they come to a close. Um, we don't own the group, you know, the individuals are free beings, you know, if people want to um, facilitate kind of like a peer group model after. We love that because that allows us to step back and really celebrate um, the commitment of that, that time in that group. And maybe that would be a higher frequency. Okay, and in terms of this question um, from Heather Prost, uh, um, final two months of training and uh, wanting to offer your services. Again, um, I think it's about if you are offering your services, um, just really educating people and being as transparent as you possibly can um, because technically you're you know not licensed yet but that doesn't mean you can't help so recognizing and just really in, and spelling it out in black and white hey i'm i'm two months away from graduating here's what i know how to do here's what i might not know how to do do and here's what the group is all about um i think that's up to you I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, please, Kathy. If um, we've got one group or one uh, session left in a 10 week group session, but it was a video uh, group, has anybody had to incorporate a, uh, a video session into an online group session? A video session into an online group session. So we're, we're going to meet tonight by Zoom, mm -hmm. but I wanna show the last session of the, of the video. Oh, so you have a video that you would normally show? Yes. Right, yeah. Heather, I think, can speak to the, no, she's giving me the eyes, okay. <laughs> I, you can share your screen, right? So you, same as, you know, how I did the presentation today, right? Mm -hmm. You can share your screen. So if the video, if you can get your video 
open on your computer, mm -hmm. all you have to do is press share screen and then you, your participants can see the video. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, okay. just like I did the presentation today with the slides. Oh, cool, okay. Jennifer? Yeah. It's Sarah. Um, I just wanna let you know that we've we tried that with the YMCA Youth Mindfulness Group um, and the share screen function with videos was quite laggy. So okay. what we did instead was we sent out, I mean, if, if the video is saved somewhere, ours or YouTube, we sent out the link and then queued everyone to a minute second marker. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that's gonna be a problem with other videos, but the share screen feature with videos was proving to be somewhat problematic. Good, good. So is that Maybe that everybody played it at the same time? So everyone, yeah, everyone went on mute um, and then they played the video and we actually, they had to do it a start stop a couple of times. So they said, watch from this minute marker to this minute marker, stop, we'll regroup, chat, and then that's how they did it. Good to nice. know, thank you. Flexibility. <laughs> Leslie here from UBC and we're <laughs> looking to do a support group for trauma survivors. Speaking of going on the fly. Um, so I really appreciated how you're talking about front loading and prepping people and we're thinking a lot about that in terms of creating safety. And I'm wondering uh, for the facilitators, when you have, you know, we can do all the prep we want and still there's going to be people who get triggered out of nowhere. There's going to be people who take up a lot of space and just wondering if you have any um, pointers about how to gently uh, you know, calm people down or just interrupt. <laughs> it's, yeah, interrupt to help contain them. Great question. Thank you, Leslie. Um, Kristen, Heather, anyone? Anna? Yeah, um, I think, again, we haven't run into a whole lot of this, but I imagine that it's something that can happen. And in the couple of times where people have been really chatty and we've been close to the end or had to wrap it up, just using the skills that we already have from, you know, doing in-person group therapy or one-on-ones has been really helpful. And then there are some Zoom functions like direct chatting to one individual that can be really helpful, which is a big reason why we have two facilitators. So if, if Anna was leading the group and I'm there as kind of like the, the supporter, I could reach out to someone through the chat function just privately and, and say something uh, take a breath, do you need to step out or whatever that might be. Um, worst case scenario, you can mute people, but I imagine that's not the most like trauma-informed thing in that moment. But um, I, I, I wonder also about taking them into a separate Zoom room uh, with one of the co-facilitators would be a good way for someone who's really decompensating in group uh, to take that out of the group. For sure, but even to be able to gently get in there to do that. So I appreciate the, the chat function. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, some of the pitfalls or challenges of regular facilitation are the same with this. So prepping people ahead of time to know what a facilitator's role is, and that is about the creation of safety and connection. And, um, you know, it, it is a little bit funky and different. I'll, I'll say the last time I had to kind of interrupt and manage time in uh, Heather in my stream, um, it was even harder and I felt more self-conscious than I would in a face-to-face -face group, which I always do anyways. <laughs> I don't think I'm alone there. But I think just being really transparent and knowing that everyone is there hearing and watching and getting the benefit of doing that in a good way. Um, and so if you have done group norms in a way that you're comfortable with, it's, it's a, just a repetition maybe then at that point. Uh, but yeah, we haven't started yet to use those breakout rooms in Zoom, but that could be really phenomenal. In addition to a lot of really good, I think, profile information, like contact information about the different participants so that let's say someone does disappear and you don't know if it's being triggered or a tech issue, you have multiple ways of checking in with that person. Thanks, Anna. I'll just add um, two other strategies. What Heather and Anna shared was, was perfect. Um, one is letting people know ahead in advance kind of what 
the approximate time, like we're gonna do a check-in, we only have an hour together. So as we go around trying to keep to one to two minutes or two to three, whatever is just determined, I think helps to kind of contain it as best we can. And um, we've also encouraged people to bring their, like a journal or a piece of paper, because oftentimes when in group session, naturally like we're, we wanna share or, or something comes up for us, we have a ha moment. And it's a little bit harder to navigate that conversation when you're unmuting and muting and all of these things. So if, if participants, you know, have that aha moment, they take a moment to reflect and write it down. Then when it comes to them, they're able to participate in a maybe less disruptive way. Um, I know it's kind of a bit different than how we usually like to have groups. So. Awesome. There's a, there's a question in the chat. And then I think um, I'm going to encourage us to um, end at uh, quarter after, because um, I think we could talk all day about this. Um, question in the chat is, when you're screening out for safety reasons, where are you referring to in this day and age of online therapy? Great question. So, um, so we will, based on the person and their resources, um, create or help them create a mental health plan of some sort. And that, if that um, includes a safety plan, then we'll build that in. And so a mental health and a safety plan is about identifying any coping strategies, any support systems in that person's family or friend group, um, anything around, you know, family doctors, virtual health care. Um, we have been um, working with clients, obviously, who are quite suicidal. Um, we haven't had a ton of our real high risk clients in these groups. Am I, am I wrong about that? Are there some um, clients who are, are struggling with suicidal ideation in our groups right now that you know of? The, yeah. So, so we have, um, when we have someone who is severely at risk, we've been really struggling with, okay, well, great. Like, are we sending them to a hospital that we don't even know if that's better for them? And um, so we've been just consulting a ton and talking things through with each other and trying to bring in our code of ethics and trying to bring in different opinions because um, this is all uncharted territory. Um, and uh, yeah, like, safety issues during COVID are a lot different than how we normally deal with safety issues. So that's not a real answer, but it's a very vague answer. <laughs> I can chime in. Um, I mean, we, I think have been looking at the um, accessible community-based resources that we've also always looked at and kept those on hand, but also really trying to be up to date. Like are there still long wait times? You know, what is it realistically like to refer people to different places? But also there have been free resources that have popped up. And I don't know that those are obvious to a lot of people. It's sort of day to day if you're on a Facebook COVID site or something like that. And so um, although online therapy is definitely not accessible for everyone, there are options right now for people. So we definitely take it case by case and see what may be available for each. Great, anything to close up? I just, I just wanna say thank you so much for everyone coming, this is amazing. And it was very nerve wracking and insecurity provoking um, and vulnerable, but um, fun and exciting to see everyone. So any other thoughts? Okay. <laughs> All of our hands are clapping. Okay, awesome guys. Well, um, take care. I'm gonna be emailing out next steps and all the resources, so stay tuned for that. I'm gonna end us off. See you later.